Good morning and welcome to the seventh meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2019. Can I remind everyone to please turn mobile phones to silence during the duration of the meeting. We have received apologies today from Tavish Scott, MSP. Agenda item one is a decision on whether to take agenda item three in private today and also decide whether or not to take consideration of evidence and additional support needs in private at the next meeting. Can I have approval for that? Thank you very much. Um, the next item of business is item two. Um, it's our first evidence session in the follow-up review of the recommendations from the committee's 2017 report, Additional Support Needs. Before we begin the formal evidence on this issue, I would like to take an opportunity to thank the parents, the young people and other attendees who came to the informal focus group meeting last Wednesday evening. The experiences shared were very informative and often very moving. And thanks to the many attendees for taking time to share their perspective with us. We are starting by hearing from a part of witnesses, including those involved in the tribunal system, Children's Commissioner's Office and Inclusion Research. And can I welcome to the meeting May Dunsmuir, President Health Education Chamber, First Tier Tribunal Scotland. Nick Hobbs, Head of Advice and Investigations, Children and Young People's Commissioner Scotland. And Professor Sheila Riddle, Director for the Centre of Research in Education, Inclusion and Diversity from the University of Edinburgh. Um, and if you could please indicate if you'd like to contribute um, to, to the questions to myself and the clerks and we'll, we'll try to ensure that you get in on all points. Um, uh, but could I open by asking uh, to give a brief outline of, of what your work is in this area, but also anything um, of significance since we produced a report in 2017. And can I go to uh, Ms Dunsmuir first? Yes, um, the Additional Support Needs Tribunal was created some years ago and has been in operation now for around 14 years. Uh, in that time, there have been a number of legislative changes, two of the most significant uh, being the uh, introduction into the legislation of the definition of a looked after child. In 2010, those provisions were commenced and looked after children were automatically considered to have additional support needs. And I think the expectation at that time was that that would open the floodgates and we would see uh, a rather overwhelming number of looked after children coming to the tribunal, which uh, hasn't been the case. The uh, other legislative matter of significance is the alteration to the law by the Education Scotland Act 2016 which for the first time extends uh, rights to children aged 12 to 15 years to make a reference to the tribunal where they have the capacity to do that and where their well-being would not be adversely affected by doing so. This has been heralded as the greatest extension of rights to children uh, across Europe. And since that legislation came into force in January, January last year, we have received two references uh, raised by children in connection with CSP claims, raised by their own hand and in their own right. Uh, and uh, in conclusion, I would say that the Additional Support Needs Tribunal is a specialist jurisdiction well geared up to attend to the particular needs that come before it. But it is a low volume jurisdiction, despite the increasing number of children in Scotland who are considered to have additional support needs. Thank you. Professor Riddle? Yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, we're doing research funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, which is looking at the extension of rights to children in England and Scotland. And actually, the rights go a lot further in Scotland than in England. But overall, we're tending to find that local authorities in Scotland have not done a very great deal to extend these rights to children. The Scottish Government has funded the My Rights, My Say um, service providers who are providing child advocacy, information and advice and legal support. And they appear to be doing a good job in terms of helping children and young people. But in local authorities, there is a general lack of attention, I think, to parents and children's rights. 
And an important indicator of this is the decline in use of statutory support plans in Scotland, which is extremely worrying and is continuing. The little table, figure one, I put into my uh, little submission actually makes clear that many of the new rights depend on having a statutory support plan. So saying that you're, you're extending children's rights while actually winding down the plan that actually guarantees those rights is really nonsensical. So at the moment in Scotland, we have more and more children, up to 35% in some local authorities, being identified as having additional support needs. But at the same time, the proportion of the total school population that has a CSP is now less than 0.3%. So unless parents and children have this statutory support plan, they have no means of challenging local authority provision and also making use of the tribunal in many cases. There are other routes, but for children in particular, the CSP is extremely important because obviously they can't make placing requests. So um, I think that parents and children are being misinformed by local authorities and schools at the moment. They're being told very routinely that CSPs have no value, do not provide any access to services, and a proliferation of fairly meaningless plans are being used instead. And people are just not being told that these have absolutely no legal status whatsoever. I think it's a mistake that the Scottish Government has launched two legal and planning processes side by side. So everybody in schools think that the pro, the, all the focus is on GERFEC and a child's plan associated with that, but that is actually not an education document. It, isn't, it doesn't provide any rights and it cannot be challenged in law. So there is a great deal of confusion, I would say, at the moment, and this isn't working to actually support rights. I think that for rights to be effective, they have to be simple, clear and geared towards the user the service user, and this isn't the case at the moment. So that's the essence of what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, Mr Hobbs? Good morning. Um, the, the role of the, as the committee will be aware, the role of the Children's Commissioner's Office is to promote and safeguard uh, the human rights of children in Scotland. And so from that point of view, um, our interest in, in ASN issues starts at that, at that broadest level. Um, the... ASN has been consistently since the foundation of the office one of the most frequent subjects um, on which children, young people and families contact us through our advice function. Last year it accounted for um, more than 10% of the calls and contacts into our advice line. So it's something we're, we're kind of interested in at that, that broadest level. More specifically, um, May referred to the, um, the Education Act. Our office expressed significant concerns about the human rights compliance of that legislation at the time it was going through Parliament. Um, we retain all of those concerns. Um, if anything, I think having seen the, the guidance and the code of practice um, that's associated with the, with, the, with the legislation, those concerns have, have magnified. Um, I think that act is in breach of at least three international human rights treaties. Um, significantly concerned about that. I would echo um, Sheila's concerns about CSPs um, and about the practical ability of children and young people to, um, to access and to exercise um, their rights um, and to, to access the tribunal. Um, and clearly, uh, last year, for the first time, uh, we exercised our formal powers of investigation to look into restraints and seclusion in schools. Um, and the, the outcome um, and the findings and the recommendations of that report uh, are something that we're, we're very interested in talking to the committee about. Thank you very much. I'm going to open to questions from committee members. I'll move to Mr Gray. Thanks very much, uh, convener. Good morning. Um, I uh, wanted to ask a question about CSPs, largely based on the evidence provided by Professor Riddle. And to a degree, you've, you've answered quite a lot of what I was going to ask in your introductory remarks, which I think were very clear. But maybe I could just press you a little on the... Uh, the detail of it. Um, in the table uh, which was provided, um, it said that um, the percentage of children identified as having an additional support need with a CSP was 1%. You actually used a figure there of 0.3%. So is that a more up-to-date figure? 
about. I was talking about the percentage of the total population, which is 0.3%. Right. Okay. The other figure is to do with the percentage of yeah. children with additional support needs. Yeah. It's a different number that we're talking about sure. a percentage okay. of. And, of course, as the proportion of children with additional support needs goes up, yeah. then the number looks bigger. OK, so, so those children with additional support needs of a duration of more than a year are entitled to, in law, a, a CSP. That's correct, is that right? Well, there is a very tight legal definition in Scotland, which I think is too tight, but the child, according to the law, has to be getting significant input from agencies other than education. This was put into the 2004 legislation. I think that we should be giving CSP, well, not, they wouldn't be called CSP, we should be given, giving statutory support plans to children who have very significant educational needs that require a significant additional support than that which is normally available in the classroom. So what is happening is that local authorities have been saying, well, we can't get input from social work and health, therefore the child isn't getting additional support, therefore they don't qualify for a CSP. But the child actually needs additional support. So as services from other agencies are being taken out of school, children are being deemed not to qualify for a statutory support plan, which is why they're going down. We have to remember that 2% of children had a record of needs prior to 2004. And the Scottish Government told us very clearly that they anticipated no decline in the proportion of children with a statutory support plan. And clearly th this isn't what's happened. So, so I'm trying to get at, at why, this, why this has happened, because I think all the members of the panel have identified this as a problem. Um, uh, and if nothing, if nothing else, it affects uh, the ability to access the tribunals, doesn't it? So, so in your introductory remarks, you suggested that local authorities were telling parents that CSPs were of no value and that there were other plans which they, 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 they thought were uh, more useful, but, but you made the point, had no statutory basis. Yes. But in your answer there, you said that the problem here really was that the non-educational support services weren't available and therefore the children didn't actually qualify for... So I'm, I'm not sure which, which is it. What's causing the decline? within schools and local authorities because they think that you've got to be getting the service to getting a CSP. But that's not the case. You've got to be needing the service. And so what we're finding is that, for example, if a CSP is open for a child at primary, when the child moves to secondary, they're saying, well, we're no longer getting speech and language therapy. We're no longer getting occupational therapy. We're no lo longer getting support from social work and CAMS, let's say. So the child doesn't need a CSP, whereas the child desperately needs a statutory support plan. So you think local authorities are misinterpreting the legislative entitlement, the statutory entitlement in my view yeah. they are but I'm not a lawyer here of course but if you sure. talk to people like Ian Nisbet who's a real expert in this area he would support my view so I do think that there are serious problems and I think it's to do with the fact that local authorities when the 2004 legislation was introduced didn't want to have statutory support plans at all I've done an analysis of the evidence they put in at that point and the local authorities never liked allocating individual resources to children they also disliked the fact that the a statutory support plan has clear time frames associated with it and it necessarily necessitates regular reviews and parental and child involvement. So local authorities and schools feel that this is actually too much work given their resource constraints. A further problem is that records of needs prior to 2004 were administered effectively by the Educational Psychology Service, who were expert in doing this and had the clout to get multidisciplinary teams round the table. After 2004, what happened was that the responsibility was passed to the schools and teachers do not have time or expertise or knowledge in order to do that. We found that many people in schools who are working in ASFL actually don't know what CSPs are. 
And just to put this in context, in a big Scottish secondary of 1,200 children, we now have either one or no children with a CSP. So the expertise in schools is simply not there. I think, personally, it would be much better if educational psychologists fulfilled a much larger role. Thanks. Just, just one last... Just, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I think Mr. Ms. Dunsmere wanted to... Um, yes, I just wanted to add to much of what Sheila has said and uh, answer Mr. Gray's question from another perspective, a simpler perspective. From the tribunal's experience, it would appear that, quite simply, not enough in education actually understand what a CSP is. Secondly, they are unaware that where the criteria is met, there is an obligation to provide one. Um, the majority of people that I speak to from a wide range of education authorities believe that they have a choice. So if they provide a local plan, and remember we have no common um, uh, definitions across the education authorities, they're all providing different types of plans. But uh, by way of example, I looked at two recent references and the CSP request was refused. One on the basis that the child's plan was adequate, the other that a different type of local plan was meeting the child's needs. And in both of those cases, if the criteria for the CSP uh, was met, then the Education Authority actually doesn't have any choice. Now, when that's conveyed by me to an audience of educationalists, I can see the face change from a nice rosy pink to pale white. And it's a piece of work that, as President, I try to reinforce on visits to education authorities. So I think it's not just about the complexity of the plan, uh, sorry, the criteria itself. And I agree with Sheila, it's far too complex. And I actually like the uh, suggestion that she gives in her evidence in terms of what the criteria ought to be. But I think there is a simpler uh, matter at play here, and that is an absence of knowledge and an absence of uh, understanding of legal obligations. Thanks. Just had one wee question of clarity on the numbers. I'm still a bit confused about the numbers here. <clears throat> so as a layperson coming at this, I see this 1% figure, and that makes me think that 99% of children with ASN are denied their statutory right to CSP. That, that's not quite right, is it? Because they might not all meet the criteria. So, so what, what's the kind of volume of children do you think, or percentage of children who are actually being denied their, their legal right to CSP? Well, I would have thought that, for example, most children who are looked after stroke care experienced should have a CSP. Since 2009, there has been an obligation on local authorities to assess whether this particularly vulnerable group of children should have a statutory support plan. These children are all getting support from education and from social work, so they would qualify. So why are not all of these children having a CSP? What was, what was the number of record of needs that you said previously? It was 2% of the total pupil population. Okay. And this and is that, now 0.3%. Yes. So that might be a useful yes. comparison. And the fact that the numbers have been going down year on year yeah. is also important. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, I move to Mr Greer. I'd like to uh, <coughs> excuse me, just go back to something that uh, Professor Riddle said a minute ago. And let me know if, if this is uh, not a fair characterisation, but uh, would it be broadly correct to say that at school level there's a significant misunderstanding or lack of knowledge around CSPs, but at local authority level there often is some level of understanding, but there's a significant reluctance to grant CSPs because local authorities' resources are stretched and they don't want to grant something so resource intensive. That would be true. I mean, when the responsibility was de facto passed over to school, there wasn't any assessment of whether teachers had the knowledge, experience, training, time to do this. And so the local authorities, I think, were fairly sure that by doing this, CSPs would kind of die the death. And that is exactly what has happened. Thanks. But I would say that the Scottish Government needs to accept its responsibilities a lot more than it is doing. After all, it is the state that has the responsibility for ensuring the rights of parents and children. So passing the responsibility down to local authorities and then local authorities passing it down to schools doesn't seem to me to be good enough. 
And uh, moving to those children, young people who do have a, a CSP, I'd be interested in the experiences that you've all encountered here. Where CSPs are in place, uh, are you finding that the commitments made in them are being consistently lived up to, particularly when it's uh, involving multiple departments within a local authority? Uh, I think we are all familiar with the challenges that so many children and their families are facing in getting a CSP in the first place. But for the 1% uh, who have them, once they get a CSP, are those commitments actually being met? I can um, comment on that from a tribunal perspective. Obviously, the uh, applications in connection with CSPs that are brought to the tribunal are not... Um, being considered either to be being met or, or being delivered in the fashion described. There is a, a case that I referred to in my evidence, the City of Edinburgh against Star, which is actually a, a good case perhaps for the committee to have a look at. It's very well set out and it explains why the failure to provide an adequate CSP actually amounted in that case to discrimination. Unusually, this case came initially to the tribunal as a reference claiming that the terms of the CSP were inadequate. And then it came uh, as a claim because, quite simply, the um, appellant, the parent in this case, felt that the reference route was just not productive enough. And uh, the Inner House of the Court of Session upheld the appeal on the basis of the inadequacy of the CSP. And in essence, it simply, in a couple of sentences, said the child shall receive support from various people at various times, more or less. It, it, it simply didn't set out what ought to be provided when, how and by whom. And, and perhaps I could just comment on one of the points you made earlier about CSPs being resource intensive. I, I actually think that's a bit of a fallacy. I don't think the CSP is intended or even needs to be resource intensive. I agree, it's far too complex a test to get a CSP. But when there is one in place, it ought to be setting out what should be best practice in any event, which is specification and clarity, timing and review. And really, that ought to be what's in place for any of the educational objectives that require to be met of any child with additional support needs. So I think there's a whole host of um, misconceptions surrounding the CSP, one of which I absolutely agree that is, that is a probable reason for a local authority, an education authority perhaps, to, to feel less inclined towards a CSP, but I think it is a misconception. And the last point I would make uh, in connection to the point Sheila made about the looked after population is that Govan Law Centre in 2013 and then in 2015 made a freedom of information request to all of the uh, education, all of the 32 local authorities asking uh, how many of their looked after population had a CSP. And the reply uh, was uh, clarification that many didn't actually know how many of their uh, pupil population were looked after and some hadn't been assessed and many uh, did not have CSPs at all. So I just wanted to finish that point. But uh, in, in essence, uh, we see at the tribunal CSPs that aren't working well because they lack in specification or they're not being reviewed regularly enough or there's a failure to actually set out clear ways in which the educational objectives are going to be met. To me, uh, the, the nature of our office and the, the way in which we engage with um, children and families means that people tend not to phone us up to tell us how wonderfully well things are going and how happy they are with the support that's being provided. Um, but I would say that of all of the ASN-related cases um, that I've come across in the the slightly over 18 months since I've been with the office, I can't think of a single one where there was a CSP in place. Um, and in most of those cases, um, the parent wasn't aware what a CSP was. Um, so I, I think anecdotally, um, and I would obviously defer to, to Sheila's evidence, but, but anecdotally in terms of our experience, that kind of absence of, um, of CSPs is, is definitely something that, that we're conscious of. And it becomes particularly significant, um, as both my fellow panellists have mentioned, because the CSP, the importance of the CSP is that it, it comes along with a set of legal rights. It's not the same as um, a child's plan under GERFEC. It's not the same as um, a local authority alternative plan. This is a, there's a particular reason why this plan has statutory force, and it's because it comes along with legal rights that can be enforced. <laughs>
Professor Riddle, in, in your submission, again, forgive me if I misunderstand this, but you mentioned the, the English equivalent to CSP. It's not like for like, but the, the, uh, the English equivalent, the proportion of children who have one of those has actually gone up. I was wondering if in your research you've looked into why that's happening in England. I, historically, over the last couple of years in Scotland, there's been a bit of lauding ourselves over the fact that we've broadened the definition of additional needs, so in theory, more children should be getting more support. That's not been the case, but in England, where they have kept a considerably narrower definition, the proportion of children getting that kind of intensive plan has gone up. Do you know why? I think it's a different education culture in England. And again, I'm talking in generalisations here, so you have to be really difficult, you have to be really careful about not going in for gross generalisation. But there is a much stronger parental lobby in England, I think, and probably a greater awareness of parents' rights. Uh, but again, when we look at England, we find big differences by English region, um, and probably education, health and care plan usage is highest when parents have the greatest awareness of their rights and local authorities are more responsive. And also, there is much greater use of the tribunal in England relative to population. So per head of population, 10 times as many cases are going to the tribunal in England as is the case in Scotland. And just one final uh, brief question. Uh, the parental and children's rights have been brought up on a number of occasions now. Um, I found, certainly from my experience of casework of individual constituents who've come to my office for help, that very often it starts off from a place where the family doesn't know their rights, but even once they do, that is not actually resulting in much progress being made. So there seems to be a very fair argument. There's a substantial number of people who don't know their rights and would benefit from knowing them, but the benefits are not nearly as significant as they should be because once they find out what their rights are, they're still not actually getting uh, the services that really their, their children are entitled to. Is that, I'd be interested particularly in, in Ms Dunsmuir's experience through the tribunal, is that something you're finding that even once families are very well informed of their rights, it's not the breakthrough moment that it should be? Um, I can't really say that's the case from the tribunal's perspective. My experience is that very few people know about the existence of the tribunal. And when I've informed parent groups in particular of their rights to access the tribunal, they are um, quite, uh, quite surprised that the, that right even exists. Um, what, what you do have to bear in mind is that by the time a case comes to the tribunal, the parent, the school, all of those involved will have reached a point of exhaustion. There is a very long journey before a matter comes to the tribunal. And I've been asked the question, ought it, be, ought it to be the case that a, a matter comes quicker to the tribunal? And I can't really answer whether that would be a better and more effective remedial route, because we don't see that in practice. We see the long journey and then uh, the, the, the tribunal. Although I have to say, um, of the, we've, we've received four child applications this year, two claims and two references. And I have to say children are exercising their right to come to the tribunal far more quickly than a parent has been. Now, that's a very limited number, um, so it's very difficult to read much into that. And it's the first year since uh, rights have been extended uh, to children to make references. But, but it's an interesting uh, point. Um, so it would be difficult for me to analyse, given the low volume jurisdiction we are at present, it would be very difficult for me to analyse that and, and to conclude as you've suggested. But it's my experience anecdotally that um, where parents are informed of their rights to access the tribunal, they're very interested in engaging those rights. Just a very brief follow-up on that, and I accept it's a very small number, so it's hard to generalise or, or draw a trend from it. But those children and, and, and those families, is there a particular pattern in uh, their backgrounds? Are these generally middle-class families with a lot of existing social capital? Uh, I can tell you that um, no, not in respect of the children who are making their own uh, reference and claims. So there are three children uh, thus far that have made their that are parties themselves have raised their own application. One has uh, come back again, having not been satisfied with the Education Authority's response to their application, which was made towards the end of last year, and they've come up very promptly um, under another heading. 
and the other two are coming in with references. No, they're not. So in a sense, that small number are breaking the trend in a number of different ways. What I can say is of the four applications raised by the three children, they've all come through My Rights, My Say, which is the new children's service. And it seems to me that that new children's service in its very infancy is having a very positive effect in terms of having matters brought to the tribunal far more quickly than happens with parents. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Just to add to that, our analysis of the Scottish Government statistics suggests that you are much more likely to have ASN identified if you live in one of the poorer parts of Scotland, particularly social, emotional and behavioural difficulties, which is the biggest single category. But Inversely, you are much more likely to have a CSP if you live in the more advantaged parts of Scotland. So local authorities generally say, um, if parents really push for it, yes, reluctant will give a CSP, then the CSP may be written defensively um, so that it actually says as little as possible about resources. And then the parent will have to struggle after that to get it reviewed to stop it from lapsing. Very much. Just before we move on, can I ask Professor Riddle, you, we have mentioned variation across the 32 local authorities. Are there areas where the, there are more CSPs in place in percentage to the population of, of school children? Well, across all local authorities, the proportion is very, very low. And so it would vary from 0.1% to 0.5%. It's within that very narrow range. There's much wider variation in the proportion of children who have been identified as having ASN of some sort. Um, I'm going to move to Ms. Goldruth. You know, um, I just want to pick up on that point actually about variation, but it's with regard to classification, um, which is on page nine of your evidence, um, Professor Riddle, and I was quite taken with the, the multitude of differing approaches. Um, and I'm sure if we walked into any school in the city of Edinburgh today, we'd find examples, if you ask for an example of a, you know, a support plan, you'd be given perhaps a different approach, but something would exist. So in a school I taught in previously, it was IEPs that we used, and we also had confidential information booklets. So it's not to say that not having a CSP doesn't mean there's support in place for the child. But I wonder, the difference between what is in place is, I suppose, that legal, legal obligation on the local authorities. So perhaps, is this about risk-averse local authorities? Do you think that's the tension here? And perhaps it's just schools not understanding the, the difference, and councils actually being a bit concerned about where this might lead? Well, I'm sure that that is an element in the whole thing. I mean, I completely take your point, and May has already made this point, about the proliferation of plans. And again, this is an example where the system is not working with the service user in mind. So just imagine you're a family that is moving across Scotland. Suddenly, any plan that you have is invalid in the new authority and presumably an assessment process would have to start again uh, from scratch. It's, it's designed with the practitioners in mind and not parents and children. It should be the other way around really. Well, thank you. Mr Mandel. Thank you, uh, convener. I wonder if we go back uh, just a, a step uh, because obviously in accessing a CSP you, you have to have identified the, the additional needs in the first place. And I just wondered uh, what, what your thoughts are on that. Certainly my experience in uh, my own uh, local authority is that uh, they're very unkeen to, to diagnose uh, specific learning difficulties um, and say that they're not ne it's not necessary to have a diagnosis. It's not necessary to have an educational psychologist assessment. Um, and quite often they're, they're asking teachers uh, to identify uh, children with, with quite uh, specialist needs uh, from within a mainstream classroom. Is that something uh, you've come across? Well, the local authority has the responsibility to carry out statutory assessments. It's a legal responsibility. But most local authorities in Scotland have passed this down to the schools. So teachers have been given the responsibility. And of course, teacher assessment is very important. Nobody's going to deny that. But for more specialist things, you do need, at times, to have an educational psychologist doing an assessment, which only an educational psychologist can do, or else some sort of medical practitioner, for example, an expert in mental health difficulties may be required. And I think just 
Delegating this entirely to schools means that local authorities are again getting out of their legal responsibilities. I mean, one of the new rights that children have is the right to request a particular assessment under 2016 legislation. But how a child would do that, nobody's got the foggiest idea. And if a child approached a school, they, they wouldn't know what to do. If the child approached the local authority, well, they'd have trouble finding the right person in the local authority. And then the local authority would probably pass it back to the school. So again, I do think that because we want to incorporate the UNCRC into domestic Scottish legislation, we've got to be much more proactive in doing that. And having rights on paper is meaningless unless they're really easy for people to use. Um, and do, do you think, in relation to the, the CSPs, you were saying that the local authorities misin misinterpreted. Do you, do you think that it's the same just misinterpretation in this case, or do you think it's actually a, a deliberate choice to, to pass the buck? Well, I, I want to be very careful because we do have to remember, of course, that local authorities are working with constrained resources. But I think if they were to think about what was really going to be in the best interests of children, they wouldn't be simply passing it every time back to schools, irrespective of whether the expertise is there in schools. It's almost for some children as if their time in school is passed waiting for the right assessment which would lead to the right resources being released. So, for example, one child that I encountered recently was 14, had spent a vast amount of time actually out of school getting ostensibly flexi education when he was sitting at home watching telly with his mum and he was waiting for an assessment of ADHD which the school thought was needed but they felt that CAMS had to be involved to do that so that the child wasn't getting an assessment until they were going to leave school which is completely nonsensical you can't do anything about helping that child at that point. No I mean I've certainly seen that because I've got aware of at least uh, two or three cases again in my own constituency where uh, there are young people waiting three, five years uh, for a CEDAT assessment uh, in relation to suspected uh, difficulties with, with, with autism. Um, and you know, they're just told there isn't anyone to do the assessment. And the schools say, well, uh, you know, there's nothing we can do if the NHS and, and, and local authority can't provide you with the assessment. So, so kids just don't get an education. How, how, how is, 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 how, how, what would you suggest to parents they do um, in, in those circumstances if they can't? Uh, they, they can't access a CSP. What, what is there? You know, what, what, what would the suggestion be in terms of uh, accessing the tribunal? Reference to the tribunal, um, as um, can the child in connection with the CSP if they fit within the criteria. Uh, there are a number of tensions here. The the Act deliberately doesn't specify, doesn't define what the term additional support needs means, and I think that that's. That, 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 that's a very positive thing because it, um, it stops us labelling and categorising and narrowing things in when it potentially could broaden out from time to time. But then we have the provision in Section 2 of the CSP, which doesn't say you have to have a diagnosis, but it does say that there are certain criteria that have to be met before you're considered to meet the criteria for the CSP. And then we have Scottish Government classification of additional support needs, which is broken down to 23 different categories. And, and what I always do is I emphasise that the Act, the legislation, the primary legislation does not define, so it's not a diagnostic um, piece of legislation. But in practice, my experience is this, that teachers generally are waiting on a diagnosis. They're waiting for a name to be given before the resources will be attached. And I think, broadly speaking, uh, part of the reason for that is potentially down to uh, deciding which resource should be uh, used, which finite resource should best be used in difficult circumstances. But my concern is that this uh, most usually involves a very vulnerable uh, number of children. And my concern is that their rights are being overshadowed by resource-driven decisions rather than needs-led decisions. And, and who do you think should take responsibility for that because again you're back into that question where local authorities say they don't get enough money from the government the government say they're giving money to local authorities and meanwhile 
children are sitting at home, you know, unable to access their legal right to an education. So, you know, who, who takes responsibility for that in the system? The beauty of uh, being a tribunal member is that we are not resource-led and we are looking at the particular needs of the particular child at the particular time. So if a tribunal forms the view that an education authority has failed in its statutory obligation, then the tribunal will make an, uh, an order accordingly. And the duty then is on the education authority to do, to do what the tribunal indicates it ought to do or to take an appeal against the tribunal. Now, there are a low volume of appeals been raised uh, against the tribunal in the last year when we transferred in to the first tier tribunal with a new, easier appeal system. No education authorities have yet taken an appeal uh, against the tribunal, although in its earlier years there was a flurry of appeals um, by some of the more litigious education authorities for clarification of the law. So, uh, in a sense, the tribunal provides the, the definitive answer to a complex set of circumstances. And if the Scottish tribunal was working at the rate that the, my English counterpart is working at, then perhaps we would see fewer problems of stagnation, if I can call it that. But um, the, the tribunal isn't obliged to consider resources, apart from the, one of the defences in terms of the placing request uh, references. But when it comes to CSPs, if the criteria is met, quite simply, the law is quite clear. There is no dubiety around this. The education authority is failing if it fails to provide a child with a CSP where the criteria is met. It is not the case. The law does not say where the criteria is met, you may provide a CSP, it is quite clear that there is an obligation here. And, and I suspect that uh, in all of the education authorities across all 32, there will be a number of children who don't have CSPs quite simply because the education authority has failed to appreciate that it doesn't have a choice. It has an obligation. And that certainly, what you've talked about would certainly reflect the, the experience that we've had in terms of cases. So a, a number of situations exactly like that where um, usually the parent um, has phoned up and is talking about, they've been told that, that an assessment for autism is going to take 12 months to put in place and that nothing can happen until that assessment um, is done. And that's very much very much our advice, um, is around the, the legal routes um, to challenge that, to, to go to the Additional Support Needs Tribunal, sorry, to, to the Tribunal, it used to be called the Additional Support Needs Tribunal. Um, but I think that, that raises some other issues, I think, around... Um, around the resilience and the capacity of um, families and of children um, to challenge decision-making um, and to access those legal processes. And I think the, the Tribunal and the Scottish Government have done a great deal of good work um, that may refer to around trying to make these processes more accessible to, to children. Um, and we're hopefully seeing the fruits of that in terms of, of direct, um, direct engagement of children within the, the Tribunal process. But we still do have um, some of these legislative barriers um, around capacity and around well-being tests, and those are particularly significant for um, looked after children who may not have um, a parent or someone who's able to, to, to kind of really kind of push at that door um, and challenge decisions and ensure that, um, that you're able to make it through to that place where you can have an independent determination of, of what the child's rights are and what the child's legally entitled to. Thank you, Ms. Lamont. Um, thank you very much. I suppose I'm quite interested in exploring the policy of a presumption in favour of mainstreaming, which has to be underpinned by effective additional support to level the playing field so that young people can access mainstream education. So when you're talking about exercising your legal rights in a CSP, that is a small group um, of young people. I think we're quite struck by the evidence we've had, either um, anonymously or people, you know, families who have fought this battle, the, the theme that comes out of it is about the battle, first of all, and that even where a young person is identified as having additional support needs, it's sometimes then shifting of resource rather than increasing resource. So even for those who don't qualify to go into the legal process, there is a, a broader question. And I want to ask you some, some questions about that. Um, a lot of the, the, both the reports that have been provided by various groups, including those supporting young people with autism, talk about part-time timetables and so on. I wonder if you've got any sense of what that actually is in practice and at what point do those part-time flexible 
timetable simply become not mainstream education at all. For example, somebody getting an hour a day, but their mum or dad has to come in and sit with them at lunchtime, or half the time they're in, they're sitting outside the head teacher's office. Is there any work being done to try and take this kind of anecdotal evidence to understand properly at what point the mainstreaming policy has simply been broken? Tribunal perspective um, uh, of the 64 place, uh, the, the, the majority, vast majority of all placing requests that are made to the tribunal involve a placing request from usually a mainstream environment to a special school. So that speaks for itself. Uh, and of the 64 cases this year thus far, only one involves a mainstream school. So the remainder are all uh, placing requests made by parents for their child to be placed in a special school and again in the majority of those instances these are cases where the parent has formed the view that the mainstream provision is not adequate adequately meeting their particular child's needs and on occasion that can involve examples such as you've just described uh, most usually the number of hours that the child is able to attend mainstream schooling is felt not to be adequate and the level of support available to the child in the mainstream environment is not found to be either consistent or adequate. And the, the whole purpose of the presumption of mainstream in the cases that come to the tribunal is not felt to lead to inclusion at all. In actual fact, the way in which the mainstream school is applying the level of support required can quite often uh, lead to the child feeling um, isolated rather than included. So of the cases that come to the tribunal, it would suggest that the presumption is not working as well as it was intended. Because the, the, the child has been inappropriately placed in mainstream in the first place, or that having been placed there, they've not got the support around about them to make that meaningful. I mean, somebody who's in school for an hour um, a day, it's not necessarily that they're only able to cope with being there an hour a day. It's that the system and the institution is only able to cope with them being there an hour a day because there aren't the supports, I mean, that, which are, in my view, two quite different things. And I wonder if you got more generally a sense, does that mean that they're, they're actually... We, what's the reason we're not delivering a, main, a presumption of mainstreaming? Is it because we're inappropriately placing young people there and we don't have specialist places for them to go? Or is it because, even although we accept presumption means to me we're not putting the resource in behind to make that meaningful. There is a risk when you create a presumption such as this that you move all resources to that end and you form the view that specialist resources are no longer required because of this uh, presumption. It's my view based on the tribunal experience over a number of years that there will always be a need and a place for special schools. And um, that's borne out by the volume of and type of placing requests that comes to the tribunal. Um, the two examples that you've given are broadly the same types of uh, cases that come to the tribunal, either where the child has been placed in a mainstream environment with the support of the parents. Everyone is buying in to the mainstream schooling, uh, but in practice, it, it, it turns out not to be delivering the needs of the child in the view of the parent. Um, the other is where um, the, the, the child is in the mainstream environment and has been placed there. Perhaps it's a transition from primary to secondary school and quite simply the level of resource that the school can place around the child is in the parent's view uh, insufficient to meet the child's needs. Uh, and I have a very strong view that is consistently borne out by the evidence that I see before the tribunal that we are continuing to try in Scotland to make children fit the systems that we've created for them rather than make the systems fit the child, which really ought to be the core of getting it right for every child. I think despite the many um, areas of progress that we've achieved, we are still failing in that respect. And I think as long as we try to make the systems fit the child, rather than the, ch sorry, as long as we make the ch try to make the child fit the systems, rather than the converse, we are going to continue to see problems of that nature. Okay, um, and has, has there been researchers 
on, well, around this in, area of when it's not really mainstream? OK, well, unofficial exclusion is obviously a very difficult area to research because it's kind of under the radar. It is unlawful. You're not allowed to send children home or to say to parents, your child can only come into school if you're going to be around at break and lunchtime. That has a dev devastating effect on parents' ability to work, for example. Um, so there hasn't actually been any research on that. There has have been some freedom of information requests on what's called flexi education, which seems to be growing in Scotland. And this is when parents are told, um, please keep your child at home for, let's say, three quarters of the week, and we will call it home education. So the local authority passes responsibility to the parent for that proportion of the week. And clearly, there's absolutely no evidence of what's actually happening for those children. We just don't know. There hasn't been any research, but I think it's, it's worrying. My own view about the special mainstream debate is that we certainly need special schools. And there hasn't been a huge change in Scotland. When you look at the data, you find that for the past 50 years, about 1% of children have been in some sort of special setting. So there hasn't been a mass dumping of children from special schools into mainstream. There's sometimes that misapprehension there, I think. Um, but I do think that the capacity of mainstream schools to support children is the issue. And as we have reductions in the expertise in school, in additional support needs, and in classroom assistance, we're going to have more and more difficulties here. Um, I mean, we must acknowledge as well that some really good work is happening in Scotland. So, for example, most secondary schools now have special units attached to them called maybe departments of additional support or whatever. When these are running really well, children are able to move between mainstream and special in a way that works well for them and for other children in the class who also have to be considered. When it doesn't work well, of course, is when the child is spending all their time in the special unit but could actually be spending more of their time in mainstream. So we need to be able to learn from best practice as well. And some local authorities are doing a really good job here. I do think as well, there is sometimes a tendency to say, if we got rid of all these troublesome children and put them in special schools, all would be well. But we must remember that some of our problems have been to do with what happens in special schools. Schools. So you will remember before Christmas in Edinburgh, there was a lot of concern about was what was happening in a special school for children with autistic spectrum disorder when the teachers were saying, we can't teach these children. And the local authority was saying, well, I'm sorry, but it's in your contract to teach these children. So many exclusions for children with additional support needs are from special schools. They're not from mainstream schools. So it's not simply a matter of saying, get rid of these troublesome children to special schools, all our problems are over. That absolutely is not the case. I think we need both systems to work together, special and mainstream, and for mainstream to be properly resourced. I mean, I think the evidence we've had is not so much that people in the system are seeing that, it's just the feeling that the young person's been let down, and it theoretically looks like they've been supporting mainstream, but the reality is something quite different, and informal exclusions, very flexible timetables, far more flexible than I imagined it could possibly be, it's still been defined as, um, a, a, as mainstream. Is that something that the, the Children's Commissioner is looking at in terms of a broader issue around, I mean, enforcement of a legal right is one thing, but actually the general policy not on the ground being real, is I wonder if that's an area that you've looked at? It's certainly something that's come up um Again, through the contact with with children and families on the um, through the advice service, um, exactly the concerns that have been that have been expressed, and, and we touch on it in the investigation report, where we raised concerns about the use of seclusion, not just in terms of the, the, the kind of the fairly obvious human rights breaches that come from locking a child in a room, um, but actually from for this being used as a form of behaviour management and as a form of um, as a form of exclusion without having to go through the legal process um, that you should be going through if you're taking a decision to exclude a child. It's not something that we're um, specifically um, specifically looking at in terms of a, of a follow-up to the to the report, um, but it is an issue that that is is part of the report from in that sense. So, in terms of the connection with connection with seclusion, 
and the concerns about the way in which it's being or it may be being used to unlawfully exclude children from education and to deny them their rights to education. Just ask one last point and, and round the research because it feels like there's a rationing going on through the use of the CSP or not, um, although I think um, Jenny Glover's point about there being other plans is also true, but this is not new. You talked about records of needs. I, mean, I can recall in my own teaching career, the educational psychologist saying, well, I would put that into the record of needs, but I'm not going to be able to access it, so I'm not going to put it in. How do you... How is it possible to show that kind of... to make real or expose that rationing mentality so that you can then address that problem? Because from the point of view of the educational psychologist, she was simply being honest with the family. I'm not putting in something you can't then... In, it's, it's unrealistic. And I wonder whether that's part of the problem, that actually there's suppressed demand because people are having to deal with the real world. You know, the tribunal doesn't have an issue around resource. It's about right, but then there are people who've got to enforce those rights by finding the resources. To say that the tribunal is not always the most popular of institutions when it comes to some of the decisions and the implications that that places on education authorities, and that's something that I, I deal with quite regularly, and I have to remind education authorities that we're a judicial institution, that we make legally binding uh, decisions. But um, when it comes to how do you overcome what's, what's actually happening in practice, there is a code of practice um, that's available that it, it is actually a useful, well-set-out code of practice that gives um, a range of examples and uh, a great deal of information for education authorities to follow. But it's my experience in a tribunal, for example, a head teacher who's asked to comment on why they're not complying with a section of the code, which is a statutory code of practice in terms of the 2004 Act, they'll be unaware the code exists. So I think that, I think the reason it's happening is people are trying to juggle far more plates in the air with fewer resources, which is something I'm sure this committee hears all the time, which is something the tribunal hears all the time. But ultimately, we still have to, with our finite resources, begin to address the problems that exist. And I think uh, there has to be a process of informative learning, which begins at teaching level, when teachers are learning to be teachers. And I think that there has to be an ongoing model of learning that doesn't stop once you become a teacher. And I think we have to respect and understand that additional support needs is a singularly complex um, um, educational learning uh, environment, and you have to keep topping that up. But I also think that you have to monitor the effectiveness of that. And the Scottish Government has a role there in terms of monitoring education authorities' effective application of this legislation. So I think you have to go back to the very roots and see it all the way through and not uh, have teachers who have been teaching for decades who are doing an exceptional job, no doubt, but perhaps are unaware of the changes and shifts in terms of legislative obligations and codes of practice in terms of how uh, those obligations are delivered. Of course, the evidence would suggest that the old, it may be old now, but I remember when it was quite new, support for learning teachers who went off and trained for a year and then came back and were able to support their colleagues with strategies and so on. So they had an accountability and a responsibility. And perhaps one of the problems now is that that responsibility is spread out without the expertise and support to the individual teacher to be able to actually deal with it in the, in the way that they might have done before thing is to recognise the value of the classroom assistant. I mean, quite often it's the case the classroom assistant or the support assistant, depending, again, we don't have a common vocabulary, which I really would love to see across our 32 authorities, but the, the classroom assistant or the support assistant will quite often be the one that's providing one-to-one -one support to the child with additional support needs in a mainstream uh, school. And they uh, hold a great body of uh, practical knowledge in terms of the needs of that child, but they may be quite unaware of some of the statutory obligations that coexist along with delivering education to the child. So I think in an education environment, there's a great need for um, much greater education in this.
Um, you will know, obviously, that the Parliament voted uh, unanimously to maintain the presumption to mainstream in the debate that we had uh, four weeks ago. But we also um, took on board a lot of the comments that are coming from teachers and parents that, in their opinion, there is a growing number of youngsters who are not coping terribly well with mainstreaming. After which the Cabinet Secretary, uh, very welcome in, in my opinion, um, said that he would review some of the uh, guidance surrounding this. Do you believe that there are recommendations that you could make to the Cabinet Secretary as to what he could do to improve the guidance? Um, we've obviously got a list of three specific points whereby the automatic decision um, to use a special school uh, rather than mainstream is on these three principles. Do you believe that we should be extending these principles or amending them or are, are there suggestions you could make? Quite a difficult question, I think. Um, I mean, at the moment, there are three caveats that surround the presumption of mainstreaming, that it shouldn't involve unreasonable public expenditure, it should be in line with the parents' wishes, and it shouldn't be against the interests of the individual child or the interests of the other children in the class. And those, I think, should be perfectly sufficient to ensure that children are not inappropriately placed in mainstream. Um, I mean, it is the case now that many rural local authorities in Scotland have no special schools. Um, so they tend to be dependent on neighbouring authorities. So, for example, East Lothian would, and Borders would be dependent on Edinburgh. But many of these authorities do have special units attached to mainstream. So I think a lot of the problem is to do with how things are being managed in the mainstream system. So I'm not sure that major changes are needed. The caveats that already exist should be sufficient, I think. Because obviously there, there are concerns, very genuine concerns amongst the teaching profession, particularly in the primary sector, I have to say, whereby it does appear from their opinion that there are a growing number of youngsters who they're concerned about because they feel that mainstream schooling is perhaps not uh, in their best interest nor in the best interest for that child to be in the class when there, um, th there are other um, children who are affected um, by their presence. Th that then determines that we have to decide how to address this. And I ask this question because um, part of the evidence we were given is we know of at least three special schools in Scotland who are at under capacity. Um, one of them told us 63% capacity only, another one told us it was about 70% and another one told us it was just over 50%. So my question to you is, do you believe that in, if, if that guidance, if these three principles are correct, do you believe that the interpretation of that needs to be looked at in terms of the teaching profession and local authorities. How do we get round this uh, dilemma that we have that in theory people would like mainstream the presumption to mainstream, but in practice it's posing problems and I don't think we yet know what to do about that. Um, I think uh, I, I've already fed into the guidance uh, with the tribunal's comments in terms of some of the how some of the phraseology is set out and some of the interpretations. So I think the guidance is going to be a crucial tool. It's really important that it's as clear as it possibly can be because what we have to remember is whilst we have the statutory presumption and we have the three uh, principles set out, every education authority devises its own policies in terms of its schooling and education. Uh, and we need to be very thoughtful and examine the extent to which the education authorities' policies sit comfortably alongside that presumption. So, by way of example, uh, one case was brought to the tribunal uh, challenging a particular education authority's policy because the way it had phrased its policy uh, was considered to amount to discrimination to a child with a particular disability because it had placed an overemphasis on the presumption and they were attacking that policy on the basis that it was so in favour, so heavily in favour of the presumption that there was very little scope for the individual assessment of children with additional support needs. 
So I think that, uh, on the one hand, the guidance has to be very clear, and we need to use what we've learned from tribunal decisions in that respect as well, because the tribunal, of course, can provide clarity in terms of um, in matters of interpretation and uh, the, the judgments of the higher courts. But we need to make sure, as in all things, that the education authorities are applying the guidance, not just at strategic level, if I can call it that, senior management level, but those within schools, from head teacher to teacher to classroom assistant, actually understand the scope of the guidance as well. And I think the only way for you to do that is to monitor, stat monitor statistically the extent to which um, the, the figures support uh, the intention of the presumption. Thank you for that. My, my last question, and I think it was Professor Riddle mentioned earlier that you believe there's got to be much better cooperation between um, mainstream schools and special schools, some of which are obviously in the independent sector. Could you just expand on what you think needs to happen to ensure that there is that better cooperation? Right. Well, I was actually specifically referring to special units attached to secondary schools. I actually believe strongly it is important that we educate our children together as much as possible. The impulse to segregate is generally not a good one. Um, but we do need, as May has said, to really look at the needs of individual children and, of course, the needs of other children in the class. We can't forget that. And so we need to have much more flexibility about, for some children, having movement between mainstream and special. And it's generally much better if a child, if at all possible, is going to the same place as the neighbours, as other children, because children need to grow up together in the same communities. If we take children out of their communities, we're creating, really, another set of problems. And that can be right for some children. Residential special schools can work really, really well for a very small number of children. But it's not going to be a realistic answer for the majority. Quite apart from anything else, it's far too expensive. And we can't pretend that resources have absolutely nothing to do with this. It can cost as much as £100,000 a year for a child to be in a residential special school 52 weeks of the year. So that's right for a very small number. We should spend that money. But for most children, it's going to have to be a sensible arrangement between mainstream and special. And I am interested that it's primary schools that are saying they've got the biggest problem. Because intuitively, it's always been the expectation that it's going to be more difficult at secondary because children are having to move class, move teachers, difficult subjects, etc. Primary schools in Scotland have generally been positive, inclusive environments. But if there are a lot of problems arising in primary, it suggests that we're not doing enough to assess and meet the children, the needs of the children who are coming into those schools. We can't blame the children or the parents for being inadequate. The schools have got to be providing the services that the children need. And we can't become punitive in this. You know, we've got to punish the children and punish the families. Uh, we've got to devise systems that actually work for everybody. Ms McKay? Yes. I wonder if I could um, ask Mr Hobbs um, to expand a wee bit on the um, constraints in seclusion um, and what redress do the parents and, and carers have if they're concerned about um, this happening to their child? So the, the reason that we um, focused the reports and the investigation in the way that we did, um, which was particularly around the availability of policies uh, and guidance um, and around the, the recording and monitoring um, of information and statistics, uh, was precisely because of that reason. Because one of the things that parents had consistently said to us was that when they were raising these issues, when they were raising these concerns, they were really struggling um, to achieve uh, what they would recognise as, as kind of justice. And one of the reasons for that, I think, was because there's a lot of inconsistency at local authority level um, around the, the guidance, around um, definitions, around use of language, around legal tests and thresholds that are being applied. Um, and having that robust and that consistent set of guidance and policy in place at a national level um, and these are these are human rights issues, and as, as has been mentioned already, that means that it's squarely the responsibility of Scottish government to make sure that this is happening. 
having that at a national level means that you've got a framework against which, um, which provides predictability um, and clarity and certainty for local authorities and for teachers in terms of knowing what good practice looks like, um, how they're expected to, um, to behave, um, what the, the kind of limitations and the constraints are um, around their practice. But it also provides a really clear framework for accountability for parents and for children who are concerned where practice may have slipped below what would be considered acceptable. Um, and that means that you can actually make use of um, complaints mechanisms. Um, so you could refer the matter to the SPSO. Um, you could go through the, the GTCS um, if you were concerned about the, the conduct of a particular teacher. Um, you could, um, in extreme cases, you could go to court and you could seek judicial review. Um, so there's, there's a number of a number of different um, routes through, but the the effectiveness of them really depends quite significantly on having that really robust um, policy and legal framework in place um, to allow people to, to to understand what are the standards that we expect to be applied in our schools. And what's your sense of how what's been happening since the commissioner's report in terms of you know is, is it still happening? Is it still an issue? Um, so I think it's. It, it's still an issue. I think it's it's too early to say that um, you know we we produced a report in December and, and we've magically fixed the problems. Um, we've had the uh, the responses from local authorities have been have been coming in um, and from Scottish government. We're in the process of um, analysing those responses at the moment. Uh, I would say that we've had some really positive and constructive discussions with uh, COSLA, um, with ADES, um, and with Solace. Uh, around um, the recommendations um, and local authority responses to them. We're going to be publishing the local authority responses and our analysis of those um, in due course, but there is quite a bit of work around collating all of those responses, the responses to the individual recommendations and um, making a determination and providing some analysis about um, what we consider needs to happen next. Scottish Government, um, again, we've had some useful discussions with, uh, with officials. We've had an initial response from the Cabinet Secretary. Um, we're looking forward to uh, a further response, I think, towards the end of, of April, May, uh, when the Scottish Government has concluded some work that it's currently undertaking with, um, with COSLA and with local authorities. Uh, again, we're going to be publishing that in the next couple of weeks, along with, um, along with our response. Um, the discussion with, with officials was useful in the sense that it allowed us to explain really clearly um, and to discuss some of the recommendations why we were locating this um, at Scottish Government level. So why we think this is something that um, needs to happen nationally rather than being left to individual local authorities. And it picks up on a number of the points that, that have been made already. The idea that these are human rights issues um, and these are legal obligations on the state um, and so it's the responsibility of the Scottish Government to make sure that there is that robust policy and legal framework in place to ensure that it's meeting its obligations to respect, protect and fulfil children's human rights. Um, so you can expect uh, in the next few weeks to see probably quite a lot of information um, coming out from our office um, around the responses um, and around um, our analysis of them and, and what we think needs to happen next. Oh, thank you, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr Allen. Thank you very much, uh, convener. Um, good morning. Um, I was really, I suppose, interested in taking a step back and looking at um, the identification of uh, young people with additional um, support needs and looking at a, a, a table that we've got as a committee here. I'd, I'd probably venture to say I'm not the only person on the, the, uh, the committee who's confused by it. It's not been su su supplied by yourselves, but it's the percentage of pupils with identified additional support needs in 2017. And um, I'm sure you'll have views on this, but I'd be keen to, to, to see if you have any kind of light you can shed on why the results vary so much across the country. Um, for instance, Aberdeenshire, and look at the, the results, I should say, for, for primary schools. Uh, Aberdeenshire has 41% of primary pupils uh, identified as having additional support needs a few miles down the coast, and a similar local authority, Angus has 10%. In secondary, um, there are some local authorities, by no means outliers, um, uh, such as North Lanarkshire, who have, in secondary, 16 or 17%. Uh, but some local authorities, like Highland, uh, have 40%. The, these are massive variations. And I, I understand local authorities may have 
have reasons for collating information differently, but can you offer any insight into, as, as to why they vary so wildly? We have to understand how the data are gathered. These data are drawn from the school census, which is filled in at school level every year. And somebody in the school, it might be the deputy head teacher or principal teacher learning support, will be asked to tick boxes to say which children have some sort of additional support need. Now, it looks like we've had this huge expansion of children in Scotland with additional support needs and widening variation across local authorities. But this is because in schools, there are different accounting practices. So it's really largely to do with the fact that in some schools, if a child breaks an arm, that will be counted as an additional support need. Um, in other schools, it wouldn't. More and more different types of plan, uh, you know, uh, looked after children accounted automatically, children on the child protection register. So more and more and more plans are being counted and different plans in different local authorities, different schools. So it's largely to do with who fills in the census and what gets counted. It doesn't mean that in some local authorities there's far more additional support being given to children. There's no connection at all between how many children are being counted as having additional support needs and who's getting additional support. Thank you. I suppose, uh, following on from that, in that case, you, you've mentioned that uh, different schools will take a different approach. Um, but surely, to account for some of these very significant variations, there must be different approaches taken in local authorities. Otherwise, uh, the wisdom of crowds or whatever it is would even these things out. Uh, do you think local authorities themselves take a different attitude or rather than just schools? Well, it's not just schools. Local authorities will give schools guidance on how to fill out the census in that local authority. And so, Really, it's, it's an artefact of what local authorities believe should be counted as, addi as an additional support need. Um, and as May has said, there isn't any legal definition. It's incredibly vague. And once you get to the point when almost 50% of some children in some local authorities are being counted as having additional support needs, I think the category becomes meaningless, actually. Um, it, in some schools, it will mean every single child has an additional support need. Well, what additional are they getting to that which would be normally available? We need to look much more at what should be normally available in schools and I actually think count fewer children as having additional support needs and then ensure that the, those who are counted are actually getting some sort of additional support. So do you, do you think this, I, I keep coming back to this variety and I understand uh, and I appreciate the points you're making about some of the reasoning behind it, um, do you think though that this, you call it vagueness or this variety, has an actual impact on the, the experience of children? Or is it purely an accounting exercise that, that differs from place to place? It can be. I mean, it, it is in partly an accounting exercise. But I think the Scottish Government thought it was a very positive thing to have this expansive umbrella definition of additional support needs. So, for example, children who do not have English as their first language are counted as having additional support needs. They have no learning difficulties. They're simply learning English, often very quickly, generally very quickly. Um, I think it's much better to have a narrower, more precise definition and then to ensure that support follows the identification. That's not what happens at the moment. In fact, I think I personally wouldn't want to have children who don't have English as their first language counted as having additional support needs. I think it has been strongly recommended by rapporteurs from the UN committees on rights of children that we shouldn't put children who are learning the language as being part of this additional support needs stroke special educational needs group. So I would take that group of children out for a start. OK, it's interesting you say that as one of the largest single groups, but I'll leave my questions there. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr MacDonald? Thanks very much. Just to follow on th that um, theme, um, in your paper that you submitted, you highlighted that the number of ASN pupils had risen from 118,000 to 199,000. Uh, and as Alistair already identified, 80% uh, of that increase is covered by three categories. There's 25,000 additional pupils, a 270% increase, who have social, emotional and behavioural difficulties, 
24,000 are a 500 per cent increase of English as a second language, and 17,000 additional pupils, again 270 per cent increase, who have other moderate learning difficulties. So, having identified that there is a, there is a problem with the definition, what, what do you think the definition should look like, and, and should it be built into legislation? And I think, personally, I think this is an area that needs to be entirely looked at because I do think that many of the categories that are being used are pretty meaningless. I mean, social emotional behavioural difficulties is a highly stigmatised category. No parent lobbies for their child to be counted. It says bad child and bad family. And it's a punitive category, basically. Um, it doesn't actually exist in England. There, the category is social, emotional, and mental health difficulties. So it's much more of a focus on the child's needs and difficulties rather than them behaving badly in school. Uh, it's very much dependent on teacher subjective judgments. Um, I think, again, we'd be better off going back to a narrower definition which, which would involve much more careful identification rather... I mean, if we carry on expanding, where, where is this actually taking us would be the question. And, and you mentioned that, that it, a lot of this depends on teachers' subjective judgments. Uh, seeing the wide variation of um, percentage of pupils across local authorities, is there any evidence within individual local authorities that there is wide variation within the schools? Well, again, the breakdown by school hasn't been done because the Scottish Government uh, aggregated data does not allow us to do that analysis. Um, I suspect, yes, there would be wide variation. When we analyse the data by SIMD, we find that children living in the most deprived areas of Scotland are much more likely to be identified as having additional support needs, particularly social, emotional and behavioural difficulties. OK, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Griffith. Professor Riddle, you, you've spoken already today about um, most Scottish secondaries having a Department of Additional Support Needs, and I think that's pretty well understood now. Um, but I think what's changed in the last decade is our approach to behaviour. Um, when I first started teaching, we had a Department for Behaviour Support and we had a Department for um, Additional Support Needs. So one was about helping children and one was, frankly, about discipline. And I think that cultural change in our schools is partly responsible for some of the increases, particularly with regard to social, emotional and behavioural difficulties. But I was quite taken with that increase from 14,738 in 2010 to 39,642 in 2017. Um, and I'll, I'll try not to get too political here, but we don't exist in a political vacuum in Scotland. Um, and I wonder, therefore, obviously we had a change of government between 2010 and 2017, if any analysis has been done on the impact of austerity on additional support needs and people's needs. Well, we do know that local authorities have tried to protect their additional support needs budget so far, but many local authorities are signalling that as cuts continue, they're going to find it harder to protect additional support needs budgets. Um, we also have a system in Scotland where we don't just count children's principal learning difficulty. We, put, we count as many difficulties as children have. So if a child has learning disabilities and... Uh, social, emotional and behavioural difficulties or is deemed to have both these difficulties, then both get counted. Um, so it could be that we're simply not putting enough resources early on in managing children's behaviour in primary schools in particular, in helping all children be included and in having classroom assistance and learning support skilled, qualified, trained teachers available um, to help children. I'm very unhappy about the category of SEBD in general. I really don't think it helps us very much, actually. I think that, um, that distinction between discipline and behaviour um, is really quite important, and it's something that comes across quite strongly, or came across quite strongly through the investigation was that far too frequently we were seeing policies that, um, that located and described children's behaviour as, as problematic, as aggressive, as violent, and therefore the responses were about, about dealing with that rather than recognising these things as indications of a need that needed to be met.
Um, and that's one of the, the really strong recommendations that we're making is to, to make sure that we, we frame these things appropriately, both at local authority level and, and for the Scottish Government to, to make clear um, within national guidance that the way in which we respond to, to children's needs has to be based on that recognition that behaviour is communication and that what we're talking about very often is an unmet need that the child is trying to express rather than problematic behaviour that has to be dealt with um, through kind of discipline and punishment. I think, you know, culturally in our schools, we have certainly moved away from that in, in the past decade. And, you know, approaches to teaching and learning are certainly very much now focused on promoting positive behaviour in the classroom. Um, but I'd like to go back to, I suppose, the support and training available for teachers, because, Professor Riddle, in your submission, you talk about local authorities failing to provide information and training sessions for practitioners, parents and children and young people. So what kind of things can the government do then to encourage, I suppose, local authorities to meet those obligations? Are you thinking about a training programme or how could that be done? at a national level? Well, again, I think there is confusion about who has responsibility for doing things in terms of training. Um, I mean, the Scottish Government obviously has ultimate responsibility for making sure that staff in schools are trained and qualified. We've had this legislation about children's rights that was passed in 2016, but our work in schools suggests that there hasn't been training at local authority level and there hasn't been any training in schools vis-a-vis -vis the change. So teachers simply and classroom assistants don't know about it. They have no way of knowing about it. Head teachers say to us that they've been astonished that they suddenly have new responsibilities. They were totally unaware of it because it hasn't been communicated to them by the local authority. Um, so I think it needs to be clear what the Scottish Government is going to do and what local authorities are going to do and what schools are going to do. But there is a big problem with the training of additional support needs staff. As you said, um, Ms Lamont, that you remember the halcyon days when people used to get a whole year sabbatical to go and do a master's qualification. There has been a major decline in qualifications of staff. In Scotland, the regulations state that the only teachers who require an additional qualification, a recognised qualification, are children who are, are teachers who are um, teaching children with visual and hearing impairment. Those are the only teachers who require additional qualifications. And they're very often just getting the training on the job rather than doing recognised courses. Uh, the teachers who had the expertise through having done properly recognised courses are actually by and large retiring now. So there's a massive gap in the system and the total lack of clarity about how teachers are magically going to get trained. Could I just add something, Ms Gorutche? Yep. Uh, it was a comment you made about how we've moved on in terms of recognising behaviour and so on. We do have to remember though, as recently as towards the end of last year, teachers were refusing to teach um, children with additional support needs whose behaviour they um, felt was far too challenging. But the committee may already be aware of, but uh, just in case it's not, of the important judgment of the upper tribunal uh, last year, uh, which came from a case from the Sendus, the equivalent tribunal in England, where the upper tribunal um, distinguished in a case of discrimination the distinction between behaviour arising out of a condition and behaviour which is assaultive behaviour, which um, you know fits within the report of the Children's Commissioner recognising behaviour is communication. And I, certainly from a tribunal perspective, I'm not entirely convinced that we've moved on as much as we like to think we have in that respect, because the types of cases we see at the tribunal are cases where behaviour is not recognised necessarily as arising from the child's additional support needs and it leads to a whole manner of complications which gives rise to the matter coming to the tribunal. Just to, sorry, Oops. very briefly Oops. just to add to that, the best special units attached to mainstream don't separate out now children with behavioural difficulties, children with learning difficulties. Their individual needs are recognised and it's recognised that a learning difficulty is often associated with a behavioural difficulty. Yeah, you, I just wanted to pick up or follow on a point that uh, Jenny was making about changes in the last few years in terms of um, austerity and other factors. And quite rightly, we're talking about the responsibilities of local government and the Scottish government to try and address some of these problems. But also, there, there's a question, I suppose, about where the causes lie. And um, one of those causes most people 
would now acknowledge, uh, or many people, I should say, would now acknowledge is that uh, many families have, have found themselves under pressure from changes to the benefit system. So when it comes specifically to social, uh, um, emotional and behavioural difficulties, is there any evidence at all that some of these pressures that families are under account for some of these very, very significant changes? Well, we do know that it is the poorest families in Scotland, people who are living in the poorest neighbourhoods in Scotland, where the children are being identified as having social, emotional and behavioural difficulties, and there has clearly been a big expansion in that category. It's obviously very hard to put a kind of cause and effect analysis in place, but clearly if families are under greater stress, it would be quite surprising if children weren't reflecting those levels of stress that people are under. Can I also say that um, it's very likely that um, children who are looked after will attract that particular categorisation. Uh, and my concern for that particular group of children who I think have that added layer of vulnerability is I worry about who is advocating for the looked after child in terms of their additional support needs. And you'll be aware of the corporate parenting responsibilities that fall on education authorities. And I make the point lightly in my written evidence that to date, the tribunal has not received uh, an application from a corporate parent uh, for a, a, a looked after child. And yet I know anecdotally of children who are being changed placement from one school to another in a resource based um, uh, assessment, which has created um, disastrous consequences for children. One of the children that we consulted with in the course of the tribunal's improvements in terms of access to justice was relocated from the school in which that child was placed. And such was the devastating effect of that, that that child is now detained under the Mental Health Act. I also serve in the Mental Health Tribunal. And it's a great sadness to me that I quite often see, I was a children's reporter many years ago, I quite often see uh, children uh, people who have been children come to the Mental Health Tribunal and children who have had um, challenges in education come to the Mental Health Tribunal as well. So I have a really growing concern that the looked after population in terms of their schooling and in terms of their additional support needs are not uh, having strong enough advocacy. Can I just finally ask um, a little bit about the outcomes for ASN? Um, the Scottish Government produces tables on this and, and positive destinations are much lower in the category of ASN than they are for the, the, the full sort of school population. Um, do you think that indicates a failure of policy, given that positive destinations will mean different things to different, different pupils? Right. Well, we should expect surely all children to have positive destinations. I mean, it's not a very high hurdle to get across, in fact. Um, the children who don't have positive destinations are virtually disappearing off the radar. I mean, if you have an activity agreement, you're simply obliged to engage with a service for a couple of hours a week or something like that. So it's of very grave concern, I would say, that children with additional support needs, in some cases, are just disappearing from the system entirely at that point. Uh, and those children would be the ones from the poor backgrounds who've been identified as having social, emotional and behavioural difficulties. I've also read that um, outcomes are improving for children with additional support needs, but what isn't added is that as a wider group of children are being counted, you would expect that to happen because the category now includes more able children, for example. So we have to be really careful about saying things are getting better when for some groups they're clearly not. And I think a real concern through the, the families that we've engaged with on the investigation report, who, a number of whom have taken the step of, of removing their children from education because they're, they're not confident that, um, that they're safe and protected within the school environment. Um, and that's not, even if, even if that child goes on to, um, to achieve really impressively, that's the route by which they got there is not, it cannot be seen as positive. Um, you know, if the parent wanted them to stay in school, if the child wanted to stay in school, but they've had to, they've had to remove them, um, whatever the, the kind of the, the outcome is, that's not a positive process to have gone through. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Oliver. I, I just wondered when you uh, raised that point, 
Is that, is, is that a common occurrence uh, through your advice service, getting parents in touch about that issue? Um, <coughs> I think it's the, the number of parents who um, have been in touch in relation to the investigation report specifically, um, I would say it, it, it is fairly common. Um, a number of parents have, have taken that step, have made that decision that they're going to withdraw the child from school. I couldn't put um, numbers on it or statistics on it. Um, Beth Morrison, who many of you will be aware of, has, has done a great deal of work in this area, um, has a, quite a wide network of, um, of parents and families, um, and I think she would, she would have quite a good sense of how many of them have, have felt that they needed to take that step. But, yeah, we've certainly come across a number of parents who have been so concerned about... Um, the experience of their child in school and about the inability to to make use of um, policy and guidance and procedure um, in order to rectify rectify the problem that they have taken that step. What, what advice do you give them then? The, um, the advice really is, is around um, access, to, all we can say is access to complaints procedures, is access to the tribunal, um, ultimately potentially access to to legal proceedings um, in order to challenge um, what's taken place, but there are a number of issues around that, even in terms of in terms of accessibility. Um, again, that's why we chose to focus the investigation really squarely on that starting point of um, existence of policy and procedure and guidance and recording, so that we can get a sense of how frequently this is happening, and so that there's a really clear um, structure and framework for for accountability to take place. Okay, I think that concludes our questions today. Can I thank you all for your attendance? It's been a, a, a very valuable session uh, for the committee. And we now move into private session. <laughs>